Welcome back to Mastering Next.js. In this module, we're going to be talking about fetching data. So previously in the navigating between pages module, we talked about retrieving data from URLs and we accomplished that using get initial props. Now this was fetching data from a server, but there's quite a few different ways that we can go about this. That's what this module is all about. We're going to talk about a custom server, using API routes, using GraphQL, and finally using a service called Hazura that takes care of managing that GraphQL API for you. But first let's touch on what we've already covered. So get initial props, just to reiterate, allows you to make these API calls before that page loads on the server and then pass that in as a prop to your component when it renders. And that's gonna cover some use cases, but there's actually a lot more that we can do. And the first thing I wanna talk about is a custom server. Now I'm gonna keep this pretty brief because I'm not actually gonna go into showing an example of custom servers because more often than not, I would recommend not to use a custom server. So I'll start with the why. Why would you override Next.js's built-in server and roll your own and handle that yourself? Um, depending on how you're doing authentication, you might need to have a, like to sort of plug into Next to provide your own authentication handlers. Um, you know, you might want to have just 100% complete control over exactly how requests are being processed by the next server. And when you take over the next server, you're not just getting rid of everything that Next gives you for free. If you see in, the, in this example, we're still including Next and serving up that. We're just taking over the express part or whatever type of server you wanted to use and augmenting that with the custom functionality that we want. Um, another thing that you might want to take over the custom server for is price. So if you're going all in on serverless, you might want to consider the price of that versus just doing a traditional monolithic server that lives out there that handles all your requests. Depending on your use case for your application, it might be cheaper just to do um, a, a straight alone uh, server. So that's why you would. Now let's talk about maybe why you wouldn't. So when you use a custom server, it opts you out of two really important performance optimizations, which is serverless functions and automatic static optimization. Serverless functions, uh, which we're gonna use via API routes, allow you to get a lot of the same functionality that you're probably wanting with the server, which is, you know, give me a route that allows me to fetch some users or do some functionality. You can still accomplish that via API routes. And then when you're losing automatic static optimization, that means that you can't compile your page down to just, you know, HTML and serve that static site. And you really want to do that because that's going to lead to a better overall experience for your users rather than having to boot up, you know, this full React application. So the next team has really pushed how can we get people to not opt out of static optimization by using get initial props and push more people towards having these static sites? And one way to do that is to not have a custom server and use API routes, which is why uh, I'm going to specifically talk about that because from what I've seen so far, probably 95 of the use cases that I've used or I've seen other people use for Next.js, you can get around using a custom server. The thing that I like though, about Next.js is that opt out mentality. So, you know, if you do absolutely need to do something custom, they still provide those hooks into their system that allow you to do that. So you're not constrained to the bounds, you know, of the framework, which I think is really important. So if we're not doing custom server, uh, we're going to be doing API routes. Now API routes uh, are essentially Inside of pages, there would be different files. If you see, I have an example pulled up here on the right. Um, for example, this is the API slash users. And you get two uh, variables that are passed in, request and response. Now, Next.js, this is just Node.js, but it provides some other middlewares alongside on the request and response variables. So we have request.cookies, we have request.query, request.body. All these things that are, allow you to parse the incoming request and access that information. And then finally, when you're sending a response back, you know they give you some of these pre-built helpers like status, 
JSON and then just sending any body, whether that's an object or a string or whatever that might be. So just a really, really, really quick example of what an API route might be would be, I have a request, I have a response. The default export for this API route is return a 200 and return back this JSON containing a list of users. Now, right now there's only one user. Let's make sure I have my dependencies installed. I do, and then we can run this locally. Now we can hit localhost 3000 slash API slash users, and that's gonna allow us to see a response with a status of 200 and this JSON that was returned. So let me just refresh this. We can see the 200 in the console, and then we can see this API route returning the JSON that we expected. Now let's say we wanted to grab a specific user and we can accomplish that using the dynamic routing, just like you could do with any other page. So if we wanted to say, let's grab a user at a specific ID, we make a new folder for users. So API slash users, and then ID in brackets.js. Now this is gonna allow us to pass in any variable ID to this route, parse it, and then return a user, query the database, do whatever we need to do here. So what this looks like is, we talked about the middleware that we have available on request. We can get the query, which is that ID variable that we're passing in, and then again, we're just gonna return a status of 200 and then some JSON back to the client. So if we did API users, and then some ID, now we can return back a specific user. So these are kind of the building blocks of how you could augment your client-side application with some hooks into your database, whether that's you know a traditional SQL database, a NoSQL database, whatever you might have back there. You know, If you're calling external services via their REST APIs, you have complete control to do that and then return that information back to your client without having to stand up a custom API or a custom server. Um, it's nice to just have it completely bundled together as part of one application. Now you might be wondering, okay, how do these get deployed then? And in the final module when we talk about deployment, we're gonna to touch on now, but I wanna show a quick example of what these functions look like when they get deployed. So when we compile our code, it's going to make a JSON bundle for each individual API route. And when this gets deployed via now, each one of those is a serverless function or a Lambda. Now what that means is that when you hit that route, it only loads that JSON. So rather than serving up you know, the entire client side bundle on the front end, and Next.js prevents you from having to do that, the same approach applies on the back end. So each one of these serverless functions is independent, it has smaller bundle sizes, and this is great. So if I go look at my console and now, this is my website and I have a few different serverless functions. Um, this is the um, dashboard for my site and there's a view functions button here. I actually already have it pulled up here, but specifically the serverless function I'm looking at for my website is API slash subscribe. So this subscribe serverless function as an API route is allowing people to put in their email address and then makes a request to MailChimp's REST API and subscribes them to my newsletter. And it gives you this really nice overview of, you know, we're running Node.js, here's how big it is, how much memory it's using, and then you're able to see, you know, real-time requests come in here. If there's any errors, um, they all come in here too, which is really nice to allow you to debug things. So that's what it looks like when it's actually deployed. Um, Let's look now at what it looks like to view this information on the client side. So we've been hitting these API routes directly, but in a real world example, you're going to be calling your API from the client side. Now there's a variety of different ways that you can fetch information from the server. The most popular definitely is just a good old fashioned fetch, but I wanna talk about a library called SWR which stands for stale while revalidate. Now this is made by Zite, who also makes Next.js and now. And the reason this library was created was to solve a problem that they had seen when making 
React applications, which is sometimes you don't want to fetch all the data and get initial props because there could be just a ton of data and you want to render that on the client side so that you're still getting, um, you're still not using get initial props and you're getting that static site and then the data loads. So think about a dashboard page. You have a ton of information that you're loading for a better user experience, for better page load time, you only want to serve up the critical things from the server. And then on the client side, you want to make the request to your API to get the rest of that information. And SWR is a great library for doing that because it gives you a really great developer experience to fetch all of this information. So it's pretty simple. You define your API route, you define how you're going to fetch it and then it returns the data as well as if there were any errors. Plus, if you end up switching between tabs or if you know your content's going stale and that thing changes, you'll see that it automatically revalidates and reloads, which is awesome. There's a couple other really neat things in here that you can do, um, but overall I would really recommend checking this out and giving it a shot. You can even use it with GraphQL if you want to. And now that we have this API, um, I made a quick component that pulls in SWR. It defines how we're going to fetch this information, which is using the unfetched library. So given some path, make a request, get that response and return the JSON. So this is how we're gonna fetch that information. And I say, you know, on this profile page, when it loads, use SWR to fetch that same JSON response we're seeing right here. And if there's an error, say, you know, it failed to load. If there's no data, then we're loading it right now. Otherwise, display the name. So if I rerun my application here, and I go to 3000, you'll see loading, and then you see it renders hello, and then data.name. Now, this is really cool because if I go back to this API and I change this name and I refocus on the page, you're gonna see it get updated with that new information. Really, really cool. And if I kill my server, now it's failed to load that data. So really, really awesome library for fetching data. Great developer experience. It really simplifies things and again, the use case for this is if you don't want to pull something in and get initial props and you want to load that information on the client side so that you can still serve up a static site. The next thing that I want to talk about is GraphQL. Now, if you haven't heard of GraphQL, that's okay. Uh, I'm going to give a quick little overview into what it is and then I'm going to show an example of how we can abstract away some of that complexity and use a service called Hazura for setting things up. So GraphQL is a query language for your API. Don't think of it as a replacement for a REST API because you can always augment existing REST APIs with GraphQL, but think of it as a different approach to fetching data from the server. Most importantly, you describe specifically what information you want. You ask for only what you need uh, passing in this GraphQL query that has kind of a pseudo JSON-like syntax, and that's all that gets returned from the server. So you can add or remove information in these queries as you see fit. And the big plus here is that because you're only requesting just the things you need, you're going to have faster responses, requesting less data, and it's easier to access nested data inside of those responses. And the actual root of why GraphQL became a thing was from a few engineers who are working at Facebook and they wanted a way to make a single request to fetch a lot of different data, which is very important when you're working on mobile apps. Um, obviously, there's a lot more people who have slower internet speeds on their mobile phone, so you want to only make as few requests as possible and that's really where GraphQL shines. Um, plus, you're defining the types of all of these different responses and fields that you're bringing back, and that helps you to prevent errors. So 
there's two different concepts really that I want to talk about with GraphQL and they are queries which is fetching the data and then mutations which is modifying the data so a query is like making a git request and a mutation is like making a put or a post request so let's first look at queries so let's say we had this query which we define the type here of me as a user and the user has an id and a name um, once you set up your types it's as simple as making a GraphQL query that says, for me, for the object me, I want to request the name, which as you see up here, name is now nested as part of that user. And that would return back a JSON that looks like this. Um, there's really a lot more that you can do here though, which is putting comments inside, providing arguments to filter that information or you know, specify a specific thing that you're looking for, whether that's an ID or a range. And fragments, we don't really need to talk about, um, but basically there's a bunch of different ways to allow you to query that data, get it back, and then mutate it. And let's find mutations. Mutations, like I said, are the equivalent of put or post request, and that's how you're going to modify the data in your database. So if you had a bunch of reviews, you would use mutations then to update or add these reviews in the database. Now, the format or the syntax that they use kind of looks like you're invoking a function here and you're passing in these parameters. And what's inside of the mutation is what you're returning back after that operation has completed and returned from the server. So after I create the review, return me back the stars and the commentary. Now, I could go really in depth on all of the different things about GraphQL, but what I wanna highlight is there's a lot here, and ideally, I don't wanna to have to set up all of this. I don't wanna to have to worry about how do I structure my types, or how do I configure my application to handle a lot of this. I wanna abstract a little bit of this away, because you would have to stand up a GraphQL server to access that information in your database. And because of that, we've seen a couple companies that are augmenting this experience by abstracting it away and making it easier. And one of those is called Hazura. And it's open source, and it basically allows you to build this real-time GraphQL database using PostgreSQL, and you have the ability to deploy that or host that wherever you want. So Heroku, Google, AWS, Docker, whatever you want to do, it makes it very easy to build these GraphQL types and queries by giving you a GUI that allows you to specify you know, what your data model looks like. And then it even um, provides you an API that allows you to interact with this data. And I think the best part about Hazura is that it auto-generates all of those mutations for you. So if I define a... Um, a model for a user and I have these different fields on it, as soon as I create this model, Hazura is going to go ahead and make the CRUD or the create, read, update, delete mutations for me so that I can modify this data in the database. So let me see if I can find an example. So here's an example of this schema that gets auto-generated when you're wanting to mutate some information. So if we had this article model in our database, uh, we would get this auto-generated insert article that would allow us to provide some objects that we want to put into our database. So here's a tangible example. I would call insert article and I pass in objects as a parameter. So I wanna insert this article with this ID and this information. And then specifically, I can say what I wanna return, and that's what gets nested underneath data for what I wanna return back to my client so that I can display that information on the screen. Now you can be explicit about this and you know write things out or use static data, and you can also pass this in as variables if it's coming from a form or coming from the client in some fashion. Now, 
I think reading through the docs is helpful. It gives you an understanding of what you're looking at. But personally, the way that I learn the best of how would I actually use GraphQL, how would I see queries in action, how would I see mutations in actions, is to actually build something with it. And that ties into the next application that I'm going to be talking about, which is called Daydrink. Now, this is a made up application that I just spun up for this course, which I actually uh, deployed, bought a domain name and, and went through the whole works so that you can see a real world example. And the premise here is it's not just another to do list, right? This is a real application that provides some real value that will tie together all of these concepts that I've talked about into a tangible example. So for example, what you're looking at, um, it is an aggregation of drink specials. So for a location like a city, you have different establishments, bars, restaurants, and at a different time, each one of them offers some specials or deals on drinks or food and being, you know, a frugal person, maybe I want to find, you know, the cheapest place that offers um, boneless wings on a Sunday. And this application would allow you to do that with like a Reddit style upvote, downvote so that you can uh, enforce, you know, what are the best deals? What are the valid ones? Which ones, you know, aren't good or are false information? And you can also look at all the different bars in town or restaurants in town and then figure out, you know, which information you want um, or which deals you want. So what you're looking at here is a pretty complex example. There's, you know, different data models. They're being linked together. You have a bar. A bar has many deals. Those deals have information on them. And the reason I like this approach is because it's not just your typical, you know, this is a to-do list. I don't see how this applies to a real world application. This same model could be applied to a lot of other applications that involve, you know, reading from a database and displaying that information on the screen. There's also some other cool stuff in here because I'm using Chakra along with Next, like I'm able to toggle between dark mode and light mode, and I'm able to, you know, easily change which days or which deals I want and maybe add a new deal. You'll see my free instance of uh, <laughs> Heroku is warming up there, but now it's really fast. And you know I can filter out specifically the things that I want, or I could search for specifically the things that I want. And all of this I'm gonna include at the end in code, and we're gonna talk about some of the filtering things in a later module through React Context. Um, but now let's talk about what Hazura looks like and how that ties in to this real application. So if you wanted to set up your own Hazura database, it's really easy and I would recommend using uh, Heroku to get off the ground. Uh, if you don't want to pay for their you know, deployment or their hosting services, there's another a number of other ways you can do it, but I found it to be really easy and a pretty good developer experience. So this is what I would recommend. Essentially, there's a one-click button that allows you to decide what your app's name is. It's gonna set you up on the free tier, and then you're prompted with this console that exposes your GraphQL API on top of your Postgres database. Now, I'm gonna show what this looks like, but first I wanna talk about why Postgres? Why would I choose this over some other solutions? Now, you've probably heard of SQL. There's also NoSQL, which is things like um, Firebase, you know, or there's a variety of ones that are similar. There's GraphQL, there's doing traditional REST, you know, there's all these different options of how you want to store and access your data. And specifically the reason why I chose to use Postgres over just SQL or over using Firebase or something like that uh, was because I have relations in my database. So for a bar, I have many deals. And for those deals, I have many actions that happen on that, which are upvotes, or downvotes, et cetera. And when you're using um, a NoSQL database like Firebase, it's not as easy to tie these data models together. And it makes, it just makes it a little bit more difficult to fetch 
and manage the data that you're actually looking for across different tables. Now with SQL and you know Postgres, it's much easier to do that. But the thing I like about Postgres is that there's a lot of new tooling that's built on top that makes it easier to get up and go, uh, get up and start going faster, like with Hazura. So that's specifically why I chose Postgres over something like NoSQL and GraphQL versus just doing traditional REST. What I've found is that I, I'm seeing a trend in the industry shift towards GraphQL, and I think it's because of the improved developer experience and also the better user experience by serving up those smaller requests when you're fetching only the data that you need. And at the end of the day, if your developers are happy and they're proficient, those are the type of tools I think that are gonna help provide the best user experience because developers are gonna choose them and improve them over time. So I've started to put my money on GraphQL over just building a traditional REST API. And that's part of the reason why I chose that for this course. So that's why GraphQL and Postgres. Let's look at after setting up Heroku, setting up Hazura, what this console looks like. So this is the Hazura console. You'll see on the left, I have five different tables. And then specifically here is the data that is inside of these tables. Now this is all just dummy data that I've populated to work on this course and work on this example. Um, but the really cool thing is if I look at this deals table, let's say I wanna run a query and look at these deals. We can expose this schema through the graph graphical or graph EQL, whatever you wanna call it. Um, this is the interactive portion of how I actually look at that information. So it provides us directly in the console so you can view and mutate your data. So for the deals table, I want to get back the ID, the date added, the type, description, and location. We just hit play and boom. It's that easy. And the first time I used this, it honestly blew my mind, the developer experience and how easy GraphQL is because let's say I don't need any of this anymore. I just need the date added. This smaller query is going to be faster to return to the client and you can see how easy it is to test out these different scenarios. Plus, Let's say I look at my schema over here on the left and now for a deal, I have a relationship between it and a location. And I wanna know what location this deal is at. So let's say for this deal, I want to know the description and I want to know the name of the location that it's at. And you see where we have the nested object here. So for this deal, I get back the ID and I know specifically which location it's at. Now this location, this object, it's actually joining two different tables. We have the deals table and the locations table. And when we go look at our data, these are tied together via, uh, I have a city ID, which ties it with a city. I have you know, the ID here of a location and then when I go to a deal, I can specify specifically that location ID, which then I can use Hazura to define these relationships between the location ID on a deal and the location of a location in, the, in that table. And I can do a similar thing with what days are active and what deals are tied to a user. So let's go back to GraphQL and let's say I wanna know the days. So let's find days active and we'll say which day of the week is this active. So this one's on Monday, this one's on Tuesday, Wednesday, this one's on you know five days of the week. Again, I'm stitching two tables here together and it really simplifies this developer experience for how I join tables and fetch information across my entire database. Okay, let's say I wanted to make a brand new table and then we'll query that table, we'll put some fake data in there and we can see what that looks like. So we go to data and we say, let's make a new table on this schema. We'll call this uh, mastering Next.js, and we wanted to find which columns we have. So maybe we have 
name, and this is going to be some text. We can even put a default value in here if we want. We could have uh, the time started, and let's do a timestamp for this. And what's really cool is it provides a lot of these functions that we can use to get started off the ground. So we want the time started to be right now. We might have, uh, I'm actually gonna use a different casing here. Time started, um, let's say we want to have is active in the course, and this is going to be a Boolean. Uh, it defaults to false or true, we'll say it's true. We're in the course right now. And then let's also do a column that's nullable, so it may or may not have been here. We'll say um, they're a premium member, and we'll say that this is, uh, we'll say it's also a Boolean, and it's not gonna, well, we'll say it defaults to false, but it's also nullable. You don't have to supply this if you don't want to. And then finally, let's give this thing an ID. We're gonna say it is a UUID. And on initialization, we're gonna generate a random ID. And we're gonna say that this is unique. Now the primary key for this table is going to be the ID. And we're not gonna to have to worry about any foreign keys or unique keys here. Let's just set up this table. So we have a table, name, time started, is active, whether it's premium or not, and an ID. And we can start adding, we could add more columns if we want, but let's actually put some information in here. We'll say that the name is Lee, time started is now, I'm active, I'm not premium, and generate a random ID. Okay, we've made that. Let's say we also have Bob, they're not active, but they are premium and we have um, Kelly, and that's active, and that is false. Okay, we've got some data in here. We can see our rows. You see that the time started was automatically generated with that function, and the IDs were automatically generated. Cool, so let's go back to our Explorer, and instead of looking at deals, let's look at mastering Next.js. So we have this Mastering Next.js model. Let's select the ID, active name, premium, time started. All these fills that we just made, hit execute, and you see now we can get back all of that information uh, in the form of a JSON blob that we can pass on to our client. Now, if we only want the name, we could do that. Again, it's as easy as selecting exactly what fields you want in that GraphQL response. Now you'll see there's some other things over here. I can do a where clause and I can do an order by clause. So maybe I want to get back a bunch of information about the course and I want to order it by the time started, so ascending. So now these are going to be sorted by this time started field and I can change it to descending and you'll see Lee was at the top and now Lee is at the bottom. So I could do order to sort that information. I could do where, I could say where the name is equal to Lee. And that's gonna filter down that information and only give me one. And there's a bunch of different options here that you can do greater than, less than, not equal, a bunch of different ways that allow you to filter and sort that information. Okay, so those are queries. Now I wanna also talk about mutations for this mastering Next.js table. So we showed how we can fetch that information. Let's actually put something in the database and create data for that table. So let's do a new mutation. And remember, these are automatically generated. I didn't have to do anything here. I wanna insert mastering Next.js. So given some object, the only thing that we really needed to provide was the name. And that's because time started had a default, premium was optional, is acted have a default, and ID is auto-generated. So let's say, uh, I wanna say, we're gonna put a name of Dylan, and I wanna insert a new object into this field. Now, what do I want this to return? Let's have it return everything. So this is gonna insert a new field into our table with the name of Dylan and auto-generate everything else. 
It's that easy to create data. And again, we can start doing this for all sorts of data and really easily set this stuff up. Now, if we go back to queries, let's say we wanna do, I'm gonna get rid of this mutation. We're gonna do that mastering Next.js query again, and we're gonna see all this new data that we created. Okay, so that's how we can query and mutate data inside of Hazura. Let's jump back over to Daydrink and see what it looks like to make these requests inside of the application, what that code will look like, and how we can accomplish that using Apollo. So I actually have it all pulled up here in another window. This is our splash page. And when I click on find deals, it's gonna take us to slash deals, which is this page deals here. Now, the part that I wanna to touch on specifically is this use deals hook. Now this use deal hook, given some day of the week, we're going to make a query and give it a variable of what day of the week it is. If we're not loading and we have these deals, we're gonna return that information back and we're gonna sort it. Otherwise, we're probably loading, so we're just gonna return this back. Now, this use query hook is from a library called Apollo and the Apollo client. Now, I talked about SWR and how you can use that, and you can also use it for GraphQL. So why would I use Apollo? Apollo is probably the industry standard for querying GraphQL from React, and it's really growing in adoption and has a lot of community support. The biggest reason why I would use Apollo over something like SWR is that it has a lot of built-in um, functionality on top of just querying data. So making mutations, getting that data back and holding it in a cache, um, wanting to do batching of calls or linking multiple GraphQL databases together. There's a lot of functionality that you can do here depending on the scale of your application of your company. So I think it's helpful to talk about both so that you can evaluate which one you wanna use. But for this example, I've went with Apollo and I'm using this use query hook. Now this get deals query, if you remember, these were auto-generated by Hazura and it's using GraphQL tag to allow us to do this GQL and then tag template literal to just write this query in a string. So we have a query get deals. It takes in one parameter, which is the day of the week, and that allows us to filter down that data that we have in our database like we showed before. Now we're using the where clause here as well to say on the deals table, give me only the ones where the day of the week is equal to the value that we passed in. So that filters it down. And then what we wanna return is information about the deal, information about which users have upvoted it, what days it's active, and then what location it's active at. So given this information, we return this back up to the client and we use that then to say, if we're loading, we're gonna show a loading spinner. Otherwise, we're going to show all of these different deals and show these deal cards. And we pass in this model into a deal card that has the days active, the location, all these different things. And that translates directly to what you're seeing over here. Now, if this looks a little confusing at first, remember that it's using Chalker UI and it's using styled system to allow us to do these CSS modifications directly on the component. So if I said, you know, maybe I want to have a lot more margin on the bottom here, and I change this to a high, like a higher value here, it's really easy to refresh and then see that value change. If maybe I wanted more spacing in between these rows. Uh, I've really grown to like this approach over doing you know, separate components or extracting that out into a different library because it's a closer coupling of the styling directly alongside the component, which makes it easier when you want to delete that code to then just rip that right out. Um, and in my opinion, one of the truest signs of having that clean code is how easy it is to delete it because you want to be able to rip out things that you don't need with ease. Okay, so we have that query, we fetch that information, we map over it, 
and then we show each one of these deal cards here. But let's say we wanted to add a deal. Um, I'm already logged in and we're gonna talk on uh, authentication and the whole user flow in an upcoming module, but I have this button down here for adding a new deal. Now what this does is it pops up a modal and it allows us to enter in a bunch of information about not only the deal table, but the days active table and then the location table. So the way I like to organize my code for GraphQL is having a separate GraphQL folder and then breaking things down into queries, mutations, specific hooks that we wanna use for React. And then this is the setup for Apollo, which to be honest, I don't really even wanna go into this because this is basically best practice taken from the Next.js Apollo examples. And I think we're gonna get away from a lot of this complex setup as Next.js moves to a plugin architecture. Really the only thing that has changed from this setup is defining what the URL is that I'm trying to hit. So this is taken from an example. We changed what the URL is so that we can hook up to this GraphQL database. And that's really all we need to do. So we have our different queries in here. Let's look at what this mutation looks like to create a deal. So given a alcohol type, a description, a location, and then the days active, which is an array of a specific input format that we have, we want to call the insert deals mutation. And here are the specific objects that we're gonna pass along. The type, description, location, and then what days are active. Then again, we have this object for what we want to return back to the client when we have finished returning and creating this information. So we want to return all of this back so that we can update the client correctly in the cache. So assuming we went through and filled all this information, we made a request to the server, um, we need to update the cache. Now what the cache is, is it allows us to not have to go make another round trip request out to our database to update what's shown on the screen. So if I find where we're using this create deal mutation, which is in the add deal modal, you'll see that I have this mutation where I create a post and then the state where it's loading. So I create a post and Apollo client provides an update function. Now, after this mutation runs, you have the ability to update the cache. The first parameter is the cache, and the second is the new data that's coming in. So I want to read the cache, given this get deals query, which we use to display things on the screen, and the day of the week that we use, so what day we're looking at here specifically. I want to read the cache, I want to find the deals, and I want to rewrite to the cache to this same query specifically and update this data with the new information. So same query, same variables, but now we've added a new set of data. So doing this and updating this cache directly, which is one of the best parts about the Apollo client, is it prevents us from having to refetch from the database and make another API call. Okay, so let's actually show an example of creating one of these deals. Let's say we wanna have a food deal and it's going to be uh, $4 nachos and it's going to be at this bar active on Sunday and it's going to start at 5 p.m. and end at 8 p.m. When I hit create we're not going to make a network request instead we're going to update the cache directly and you see that happen instantaneously which makes the process overall faster prevents a network request and provides a better experience for the user. So that's what it looks like to fire off that mutation on the client. Just how we fetched deals via that query, we can do the same thing for fetching bars. And I can show kind of what that query looks like here as well. If I go to my queries file, um, getting locations, getting cities, all of those things are very, very similar. So for the locations table, bars or restaurants, I wanna get back all of this information and I wanna tie it across the city table as well too. Now what that does, is it allows me to display the addresses and information below. Plus, if I had more location data in here other than just this city, then I could change based on that 
And it also allows me to then pass this information over to a map if I wanted to, which this is mostly just for an example. I haven't done anything uh, too crazy with this, but you could really go you know, over the top here and show all these locations and provide a bunch more information. I mostly just wanted to show how you could theme maps as a fun example with this application. And this is using Mapbox instead of Google Maps, just because I like the developer experience there a little bit more. So I think that wraps up the fetching data module. We have talked about a lot. We've talked about why you probably don't want a custom server, what API routes look like, how you can create them, how you can consume them on the client side using a library like SWR. We've talked about what GraphQL is, what queries are and mutations are, why I would recommend to use a service like Hazura on Postgres, you know, how that setup looks, how you make your tables, how you query your information, how you do mutations, defining your models, and then finally, using Apollo client on the client and inside of this new application that we're going to be adding more functionality to called Daydrink and how you can fetch that information and make those queries, make those mutations. All of that, managing that data, a very critical piece of building applications. So with that, thank you for tuning in and stay tuned for the next episode. Cheers.